Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to this Brookings Doha Center Distinguished Lecture event, From War to Famine, How to End Yemen's Violent Conflict. Uh, my name is Noha Abul Dahab. I'm a visiting fellow here at the Brookings Doha Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Mrs. Tawakkul Karman. As you all know, the war in, uh, in Yemen continues to reach unprecedented levels of death, devastation, and destruction. And I am sure that those of you who have visited Yemen or lived there will agree that it is an astonishingly beautiful country with a proud and extraordinary people. Their suffering is a stain on our conscience. Mrs. Karman, your presence with us here tonight could not be more timely. And we are honored that you will share your thoughts with us. Uh, I would also like to thank Foley Batibo, principal presenter at Al Jazeera English, who will be moderating the event tonight. Foley, it's great to have you back. Um, and on behalf of the Brookings Doha Center, uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening, and we very much look forward to an engaging discussion. Thank you very much, Noha. Thank you to the Brookings Doha Center. Uh, welcome. Good evening. My name is Foley Batibo from Al Jazeera English. Uh, welcome to the Distinguished Lecture Event Series organized by the Brookings Doha Center today on how to end the war in Yemen, a conversation with the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Tawakul Karman. Now, the tragedy of Yemen is that it was already the poorest country in the Arab region, but war has pushed it to the brink. The United Nations calls it the worst humanitarian crisis since the Second World War. Nowhere else are more people at risk of starvation today than in Yemen. The UN estimates that some 13 million innocent civilians could die from the lack of food. At least 10,000 have already been killed and millions more displaced since the war began nearly four years ago when Houthi rebels seize much of the country, including the capital, Sana'a, and force the government into exile. A bombing campaign, relentless airstrikes, and a blockade by the Saudi Emirati coalition in support of the internationally recognized government have made things worse, ravaging an already impoverished country. Yemen, ladies and gentlemen, is being bombed into famine. Now, the UN and international human rights groups have blamed all sides in the conflict for various crimes that include, include uh, indiscriminate killings, enforced disappearances, systematic torture of prisoners, kidnappings. Just a few days ago, there was a significant development in the crisis. The United States, which backs the Saudi Emirati coalition, called for a ceasefire and for the warring sides to meet for peace talks in Sweden later this month, finally backing the efforts of the UN Special Envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffith. But with fighting raging on in the port city of Hodeida, is the climate right to move forward with peace talks? Is a political solution still possible today in Yemen? Given the complexity of the actors involved, both internal and external, what tangible steps should be taken to end this conflict? What can save this country, which was once a crossroads for global trade and culture? Who will save the children of Yemen? These are some of the many questions we hope to address today with Tawakul Karman. She is the international public face of Yemen's struggle a leading voice of the 2011 revolution that was part of the Arab Spring, of course, which began in Tunisia. Tawakul Karman was the first Yemeni and the first Arab woman to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 in recognition of her achievements in the nonviolent struggle for the safety of women and for women's rights to fully participate in the peace building of Yemen. She's been called the Iron Woman the mother of the revolution. She's a human rights activist, a journalist, a politician, a mother. She will talk to us today about the conflict in Yemen and reflect 
on prospects for peace. So we'll begin with our formal remarks and later on move on to an open discussion after which you'll be able to also ask her questions. So please join me in welcoming Nobel Peace Prize laureate Tawakul Karman. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. I'm going to speak in Arabic, so please use your translation machines. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to extend my thanks uh, to Brookings uh, Doha Center for the kind invitation. And I hope that I would be successful in talking about the Yemeni cause with all its dimensions, particularly the reasons behind the war and what has happened after, the war, uh, after that and also how to stop the war and how to have real peace prevail. I find myself uh, having to talk about uh, the targeting of this peaceful revolution in 2011 and I would like to summarize my intervention by saying that the regime at the time was a failure, was corrupt and has led Yemen in three decades into a very dangerous situation of deterioration and failure. And if we go back into the index of failure states, uh, you would realize that Yemen was in the seventh position amongst the failure states since 2005. These countries are trapped in conflicts, division, war, in fighting, and also institutional corruption. That is why we cannot look into this peaceful revolution as a, a kind of uh, uncalculated whim or a kind of uh, in foreign or external kind of uh, conspiracy. Similar to all Arab Spring revolutions, uh, it was a necessity. It came as a response uh, by our youth, youth who have had enough of corruption, failure, marginalization, exclusion, and so on and so forth. This was an expression of a dream, a dream for a country of justice, uh, freedom, and rule of law. After that, our revolution and its transitional phases and the outcomes of national dialogue that have set the details of the democratic new state that you would like to have, this has fallen into a state of conspiracy international conspiracy that has led into a counter-revolution to a war and infighting internally and externally for four years and still it is ravaging everything in Yemen, the land, the people and everything and it even goes beyond that uh, to target the dream of Yemeni people and their blessed revolution. We can say that the main reason of all what has happened and all what is taking place in Yemen today is the will to make them be punished for their revolution. This catastrophe was managed, was created, and we have seen so many reasons that have been accumulated as a result of that uh, in a way that has led into the punishment of all Yemenis because they took to the streets, because they wanted to have a dream, because they wanted them to be a lesson, to be a model that uh, should not be emulated, that they should be punished for others not to want to create any change for them, to give them a very harsh lesson and therefore not encourage anybody to want to change the situation and uh, implement his or her dream. And here I would like to talk about the two capitals, the two capitals of the counter-revolution, and I mean Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, who mobilized their capabilities and their hegemony in order to undermine the different Arab Spring revolutions, for them not to have 
any of such situations in their own countries because they do not want to have revolutions in their own countries uh, and uh, they do not want to have rights and equality when it comes to the rights of citizenship. Uh, within that peaceful revolution, these uh, two capitals, the capitals of uh, the counter-revolution, they kneeled a little bit uh, through giving and coming up with an GCC initiative that came up with a moderate kind of solution between the aspirations of the revolutionaries and the interests of the authorities. So the Ali Abdullah Saleh was given immunity and in contradiction with the other kind of cases where uh, the authoritarians are given immunity, immunity was not given for a price uh, which is free them no it was not done in the same way so this has led to the undermining of the transitional process so instead of sponsoring the gcc initiative that had the name of the sponsoring countries and that came up with the counter revolution and instead of uh, guaranteeing no impediment and take all the procedures that would lead to no impediment uh, and also given all the material support that would make it successful instead of all that the two countries and here i mention once again saudi arabia and the emirates they sponsored and supported the steps to undermine this revolution through silence and sometimes giving support to those who try to undermine and put obstacles uh, to this revolution and also they stopped supporting the transitional government so this uh, undermining process uh, has been carried out by the toppled Ali Abdullah Saleh or the ousted Ali Abdullah Saleh on the 21st of September 2011 the ousted president Ali Abdullah Saleh carried out a bloody coup against the transitional authority and occupied Sana'a, the capital. And here we are talking about uh, the tools he used, and his tools were the Houthi militias. I do not undermine the role played by the Houthis in the coup, nor their presence, nor their control of many parts of the country before the coup. Yes, yes, they were there as a group that controlled a number of regions, but the control was not beyond the governorates or the province or Sada. And after that, there were some areas of Sada, they were uh, outside their control. Who gave them this control? Who has given them this power? who has given them all these weapons that they have, who has enabled them to occupy the capital Sana'a and the rest of the provinces, provinces sorry, is the ousted Ali Abdullah Saleh backed by Saudi and the Emirates uh, and to a lesser extent Iran. Yes, to a lesser extent. And here, and I can argue for this uh, kind of statement. Distinguished guests, I would like to underline here uh, that most of the weapons uh, and the money has been injected to the Houthis and the Houthis have these capabilities by Ali Abdullah Saleh ba backed by the Saudis and the Emiratis and he has given them all the weapons of the state that he accumulated throughout the four decades when he ruled uh, Yemen. In March 2015, the Yemenis woke up uh, under the shellings and bombardments of the Arab coalition headed by Saudi and the Emirates. And here I would like to indicate that this intervention came after Ali Abdullah Saleh and his Houthi militias have gone beyond the red lines, after they, got, they went beyond Sana'a to Aden, and after their plan failed in putting an end to, to Al-Islah party or the reform party and 
the peaceful forces of the revolution. The ambitions of Saleh and the Houthis and the intervention of Iran that celebrated the fall of Sana'a as a free of charge kind of achievement of its camp, uh, similar to what had happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. Here, the coalition forces headed by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, they declared war in Yemen with the justification that they want to retrieve and regain the legitimacy of Yemen. Uh, and they worked on th- under three kinds of references, the uh, GCC initiative and the outcomes of the national dialogue and Security Council resolutions. But in truth, the truth was different altogether. The coalition forces has taken have taken all these references only as a political cover in order to implement their expansionist and destructive agendas in Yemen. This is the situation now in Yemen after four years of war in Yemen and all the catastrophes, the destructions, uh, comprehensive destruction that is in increase day after day being subjected to a systematic kind of methodology and through a plan and systematic strategy to destroy the people and to control the geography of Yemen. What is happening now in Yemen is a fierce war against Yemenis, a fierce war in order to undermine legitimacy and not retrieve legitimacy. This is what is happening in Yemen. The objective of this war by both the Saudis and the Emirates is to undermine legitimacy and not to retrieve it. All the procedures that have been undertaken, all the policies that have been carried out on the ground aim to undermine legitimacy and the opportunities to have such legitimacy on Yemeni soil. So the retrieving of legitimacy, what is the slogan of that? So retrieving, regaining legitimacy is to control each and every piece of land in Yemen, militarily, from a civilian perspective, and also security perspective, and also to continue with the liberation of all territories. Uh, Regaining legitimacy means that uh, it has to achieve what it came for. This legitimacy that was subjected to a coup and was inoperative as a result of that coup. So we have had the referendum on the draft constitution that was drafted and written based on the outcomes of the national dialogue that was a point of conformity of all Yemenis and consensus and after that going into different kinds of elections, central and uh, local and at the level of the provinces to uh, elect the presidents, the heads of the consultative council or shura and other kinds of institutions. But the coalition war on Yemen justified by regaining legitimacy based on those uh, references uh, has moved into undermine this legitimacy, this legitimacy for it not to be able to control all its land, uh, for it to have the weapons, monopolize them, and also the sovereignty, and also to be able to have the referendum on the constitution and to have elections. In addition to that, this war of the coalition forces on Yemen is not only to undermine legitimacy in Yemen, it also came in order to put an end, any opportunity to have a unified Yemen, a Yemen that has its own sovereignty and independence. The two countries moved on in undermining Yemen by uh, putting it or subjecting it into shelling, subjecting it to shelling and hunger, uh, and also the division of the country into small areas. The two countries have uh, occupied uh, ports uh, and uh, coastal areas, and also uh, they did not allow the legitimate government to export oil and gas, and also to manage the revenues of the state. Also, they have established new militias uh, that are against. Oil or refuse, reject the legitimacy and also the federal project and all the references that these countries claim that they have come under their cover. So the allegiance of these militias are to the new occupiers, the Emirates and Saudi Arabia. All those regions that have been liberated by the Houthis are handed over to one of those militias or a number of those militias that have one goal, which is being against the legitimate authority or power by keeping the civil institutions crippled, unable to do its job for the citizens. No salaries, 
no employees, no security apparatuses to cater for their security, no military structures that are unified, that follow the legitimate power. After four years of war, the outcome is that uh, the liberated areas uh, from uh, the Houthis are now subjected to guardianship uh, and also looting and absolute absence of the legitimate president, his government and his security and military apparatuses. Hadi, the president, cannot, cannot uh, walk in any of his provinces, the provinces that have been liberated. He cannot go back to any area in those 80% of uh, Yemeni territories that have been liberated. He is under house arrest and he has been so for the last four years in Riyadh, only exceptionally, sometimes he stays in his presidential palace in Aden and he cannot leave that uh, palace because uh, surrounding that palace there are Emirati militias. Of course, you have heard of the Hadi presidential plane has been not allowed to land in Aden airport. Uh, in actual fact, uh, Yemeni air, air, airplanes have not been allowed to land in Yemeni airports. Our planes, our aircrafts are not allowed to land in our airports, even the political forces and powers uh, that support the legitimate authority are not allowed to come back to any of their regions. Uh, those who have come back, the Emirates uh, has detained them, has uh, killed them, tortured them, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have a number of scandals of rape, torture that those political activists have been subjected to in prisons of Al Mukalla and Aden and so on and so forth. And this was announced by the experts report in the Human Rights Council last August. So the killing, the assassination through security companies, external companies that have been rented as a means by the Emirates in a scandal. We have received a scandal recently that was tackled in U.S. media outlets. In addition, of course, to the massacres that have been committed and carried out by the coalition forces smart uh, uh, aircrafts, uh, they have targeted markets, uh, uh, morning uh, houses and uh, school buses, uh, uh, weddings, uh, all of them, all uh, fishing boats, all of them have been targeted by those aircrafts, which has led to tens of thousands of killed people and wounded there. I'm sorry, uh, I would, we're talking also about those who could not find, uh, uh, could not find uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, for injured and those who were killed but could not be looked after. This all comes within the crimes and massacres committed by the coalition between the Emirates and Saudi. What about the Houthis, their crimes and their disasters? It's enough to say that uh, the Houthis have been the tool in their hands to topple down and to uh, the state of Yemen. Their pretext later on for the intervention in Yemen was that same Houthis in order to occupy the country and dominate it. Uh, uh, and that was, uh, and under the text of stopping the coup d'etat and uh, regaining the legitimacy and uh, to face the Iranian project. Of course, the militia Houthis have committed other crimes other than the mother of all crimes, which is toppling the state or putting an end state. Crimes against humanity, such as suppressing peaceful demonstrations, random uh, bombardment of cities, uh, uh, residential. Uh, uh, the 
torture of the activists uh, and put them in places that are uh, under attack, uh, and then killing uh, journalists and shutting down all media outlets and uh, stealing all the contents of the institutions of the government and uh, propagating the, the hate discourse against all, and then planting thousands of hundreds of mine, landmines and uh, displacing the, the dozen, uh, tens of thousands of children who represent 40% of the militias now, according to international and local credible reports. And there is also the besiege or the blockade on Taz. Ladies and gentlemen, Yemen is going through a disaster that the world said is a man-made disaster. But uh, the fact is that it is the made by the tyranny oh, and those who hate the freedom. Yemen, that has such a glorious past and history and such an authentic people, and this uh, strategic site which uh, oversees two seas, the Red and the Arab Seas, and, uh, and on the Bab al-Mandab Strait, uh, all this uh, has been under uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, attacks by the Saudis and Emirates and the Houthis with the silence of the world. Yemen is undergoing a humanitarian disaster in the world for, uh, has not been witnessed the world for decades, and there's uh, ravaging uh, destruction of intra, uh, infrastructure and health institutions, water and city institutions, oh, and more than 22 million Yemenis now are in dire needs of humanitarian help, and according to the United Nations, more than 88 million people are uh, suffering from malnutrition and 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 more including to two million children and uh, feeding uh, mothers uh, and the warnings say that this number of uh, starving people might uh, soon increase to be 14 th million people that's to say almost half of the population of the country according to the uh, estimates of un agencies few days ago the child called uh, amal hussein her picture was shown all the media all over the world because of malnutrition acute malnutrition amal is one of million other Yemeni children that are falling like the leaves of autumn under the the bombardment of the air attacks, hunger, landline mines, bombardment, and disease. For four years, all most of the, the parts of the world has uh, witnessed uh, a, sp a terrifying uh, spread of uh, disease such as this uh, fever of dung, cholera, diphtheria, and others. These uh, disease have led to death of thousands of people in addition to those who died in the war. And the militia uh, coup d'etat uh, forces have also confiscated all the budgets and all the money that was to be spent in basic uh, services uh, and uh, then that also increased the, the, the loss was increased as a result of the continuous uh, air bombardment and the destruction of the infrastructure even the liberated uh, zones from the Houthis are still suffering from lack of electricity water education and health, all the services that any government is supposed, any digital government that's supposed to present to the people uh, is none and not existing. And, uh, and it seems that the coalition is doing this for a predetermined uh, goal and it's not because they are ignoring what's happening or because they can't do nothing. No. No, they know, they know. The, this coalition, these two countries of countries have a lot of resources. They have a lot of air, uh, revenues and petroleum revenues, and, and they can easily feed the, 
million to two million Yemenis who are suffering from malnutrition. No salaries are paid, and if anybody anybody receives his salary, it is usually not enough to cover the basic exp expenditure that he needs for a couple of days because of the collapse of the, the Yemeni currency, and this is a collapse that was also predetermined and and that was and the coalition did not try to stop it. And in fact, it, it have even done more to make it even aggravate and be more and more, ser more serious. Uh, and it, 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 it seems that it's adopted this uh, technique of starvation and blockade as a, uh, one of the tools of war by retur returning the thousands of uh, expat Yemenis who used to work in Saudi Arabia, returning them to Yemen and through uh, controlling the different and so uh, all these resources could have uh, uh, helped uh, the people and uh, so the government could have helped uh, the Yemenis through the different means and through the aids that coming from all over the world and through partnerships with different kinds of the world that would be enough to get enough revenues for the Yemeni people. Ladies and dear friends, anyone who follows the efforts made by the international community and the major countries during these war years will not find any difficulty to understand that the essence of this policy was 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 targeting or was was aiming at leaving Yemen under the mercy of the Saudi Emirate coalition so that they can continue committing war crimes and continue to exhort them. It's important to say here that about the, there are eight resolutions adopted by Security Council about Yemen and the transitional operation and that the national community had guaranteed that it will look after this transitional uh, the transition uh, uh, process and uh, support it uh, because Yemen right now needs a decisive decision from the international community to put an end, immediate end to this war. Yemen is uh, is heading to dis the, 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 uh, dismantlement and uh, to be cut into pieces. Uh, the success of international efforts to put an end to the world and to achieve peace is depends on stopping this arms sales to Saudi Arabia and and the Emirates and and also to take all the necessary measures to stop the uh, sending to stop Iran from sending weapons to the Houthis the success of international uh, efforts to put an aid to the world depends and needs the, the uh, requires the return of the st state of Yemen, the Republic of Yemen, on all the, te uh, the national territory as a one independent, uh, unified, and s s uh, uh, stable country. The success of the efforts of the international, uh, international community in require and to achieve peace requires uh, to, to, to have a monopoly that the state should have a monopoly of arms and to, to, uh, to be able to practice its uh, sovereignty and to make sure that in, in the elections are the only way to reach to power and not uh, violence and uh, armed forces and and any efforts for peace in Yemen must uh, aim at putting an end all kinds of uh, hegemony uh, and uh, occupation of the country. Here I would like uh, to salute all the appeals that may, are made these days. I hope they are serious to put an end to the war in Yemen and uh, I would like to mention in particular the the the, the appeal made by the for the, the American uh, Secretary of State and that of Britain and I, I, I what I, but I want to say something important that uh, the call made by the American uh, def uh, Secretary of Defense to create uh, uh, areas or zones of autonomy for the Houthis is not really helpful and would not lead to achieving peace in our country. The content of this appeal is uh, to uh, 
to make the divisions on the sectarian basis uh, something permanent. Uh, and I want to, uh, to, to draw your attention to something important, that when we spoke about the national dialogue and we spoke about writing the, wrote the uh, draft of the constitution, with the, the text was that our Yemen will be a country, a uh, unified country of different uh, regions in the sense of they all have the authorities that are agreed upon internationally in such a way that every region will have its own autonomy and that that will represent, give the opportunity to the Houthis and others to present themselves in within a unified country that respects their specificity and their options. And also the Secretary of Defense of USA also said something important by saying that Yemen must be without weapons, without arms. I cannot understand how could a state exist without uh, being armed. Uh, uh, Yemen is a complicated uh, country geographically uh, speaking and has long borders and, the, and uh, we oversee the uh, Arab Sea and the Red Sea and we control one of the most important straits which is Bab al Mandeb. What the uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense should remember that uh, Yemen is threatened by terrorism and uh, uh, regional powers, and this requires that Yemen should have a strong army and strong security apparatus to safeguard the, the state and and be, be also to contribute to the regional security. Speaking of uh, a disarmed uh, Yemen uh, is uh, very risky and, and that might lead to pushing Yemen into the hands of any terrorist group or any rebel group uh, or to or be subjected to any uh, invasion projects as we see now what the Saudis and Emirates are doing. What uh, Yemen needs today is to have a strong army, independent one, on bases uh, and uh, national uh, criteria under the supervision of United States and friendly states, and the first of which the United States uh, of America. Dear guests, uh, after each war, uh, peace will prevail. There is no endless war forever. So let's have peace now. The Yemenis are ready to be in, to live in peace, and in fact, they are anxious to live in peace. And the Yemenis, throughout history, have been going, had gone into different conflicts, but they soon they have reconciliation. And history has never witnessed that the Yemenis have to wait to a point of no return. Of course, regardless of the war mongers and those who benefit from wars, the Yemenis are now ready for real peace and for a real national reconciliation and and they are capable of achieving per sustainable peace that would lead to a, a, a democratic state in which all the Yemenis live uh, in equality and in freedom. If the inter, uh, foreign intervention is stopped, the Saudi intervention, the Emirati and the Iranian interventions, we can build this. Not only this, but also we can build a democratic free state, state of freedom, justice, and rule of law. And we will be the strategic partner in maintaining peace, and stability, and security of the world. We will work with all our efforts in complete seriousness for a sustainable peace in Yemen and to achieve a comprehensive national reconciliation that we think can be achieved with, with, by the following steps. Putting an end to the world and uh, putting an end to the blockade on Yemen and the withdrawal of the Saudis and the Emirates and resumption of the political process where it had stopped before the coup d'etat and the war, and the creation of uh, a military commission under the sponsorship of the United Nations that will work on the withdrawing weapons from all the militias in such a way that the state will be the only uh, institution that have the right to use uh, weapons. And this uh, committee commission will also build the, uh, the army and the uh, security apparatus on in the patriotic and national uh, principles. And then the creation of a national government of all the components of the society 
society or a technocrat government under their sponsorship of United Nations that will work on organizing a referendum about their draft constitution and to uh, organize a uh, elections, uh, regional and uh, local and presidential and uh, legislative ones be, uh, on the basis of the new constitution. And then to create a, a national committee that will uh, compensate all the victims and then and that will work on reconstruction of the country with the commitment by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates to compensate Yemen of all the, the, the destructions that has made in Yemen. Finally, anyone who makes a, anybody who thinks that Yemen is an easy target is mistaken. And anybody who thinks that the people of Yemen, of, uh, of Yemen are, are, can easily be tamed. No, they're wrong. Because this people of Yemen is a very, uh, is a very complex uh, 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 thing and has a long uh, heritage of pride, uh, dignity, resistance in a way that any no, no uh, invasion, occupation or sponsorship forces can uh, humiliate it or impose on it, what it with what it refuses and rejects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tawakul Kaman, for giving us such a comprehensive, such a great insight into what is a very complex situation in Yemen. And we heard the recommendations that you made uh, towards the end, and I won't pick up on those in just a few minutes, because as you said yourself, there seems to be some momentum now, uh, both internally and externally, from the international community to put an end to this war. And we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. But I want to ask you about you first. Uh, you've had the ultimate recognition for your work, a Nobel Peace Prize, which has given you an incredible platform. I want to know first, as I think many people here do, what you have done through this platform, through this global platform, the Nobel Peace Prize, to uh, improve the situation in Yemen, to bring an end to the war in your country. Um, yani, what I did on a personal basis and the Yemeni women, our youth, our youth who aspire to change, who aspire to democracy and justice does not meet what we aspire to have in Yemen before the start of the war in Yemen and before the coup that took place in Yemen. The peaceful revolution that took place against Abdullah Saleh and after that we had efforts exerted in the national dialogue also we had a draft constitution that would have made Yemen make strides in the world so we have had a destruction that was carried out by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates what we are doing is a continuation of our revolution of our strive so this is a continuation of the efforts that have been exerted so far have you achieved as we know what concrete examples can you give us of your actions since winning this Nobel Peace Prize? Well, the, the most important is was that, that we uh, uh, troubled the dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh. The best achievement that we have made as a result of this peaceful revolution is to topple 
علي عبد الله صالح هو was a dictator who was behind the failure the authoritarianism corruption he destabilized not only Yemen but also the whole region we felt that that was a great achievement and what has been made is only one phase of this peaceful revolution a revolution that we thought would be leading to a democratic state we are facing a counter revolution we are still in the revolution phase we are still facing international and regional powers that stand behind this counter revolution and against uh, and behind sorry this war that is taking place not only in Yemen in Egypt in Syria in other countries we are in a great strife against this counter revolution against those international powers that stand behind this counter revolution um, during your acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize, you made several recommendations on how to alleviate uh, the suffering of the people of Yemen, including establishing a free and democratic homeland with no room for tyranny, say, dictatorship, corruption, or failure. But that's quite far from the reality that is Yemen today, of course. So what needs to happen now? What tangible steps need to be taken to end the war today? What we need now is to stop the war, to end the war in Yemen. What we need is a real international will to achieve that. Uh, so we have proven to the world uh, that we can make peace. So when people took to the streets with this great revolution, peaceful revolution. We know that Yemenis, they have their weapons, they left their weapons at home, and they went outside uh, with their peaceful revolution, unarmed to peacefully put an end to violence and repression. This is what Yemenis have done. Yemenis also have proven to the whole world through the national dialogue that they can coexist. They can also go beyond the difficulties towards the future. What Yemenis are facing is not only as a result of internal matters. Yes, we had difficulties when Ali Abdullah Saleh was the head of the snake, if we may call him so. We have had different efforts. We could have achieved the national reconciliation had the Saudis and Emiratis not intervened. Please believe me, Yemenis can achieve national reconciliation, can put an end to the war. And the pivotal role is in the hands of the international, revol international uh, community to come up with the right steps that would lead to ending the war and for Yemenis to be able to achieve national reconciliation. Variety intervention, and I want to get to that in just a moment, and your position on the intervention. But first, you talked about the need for uh, a real international uh, will for the war to end. Yeah. Just a few days ago, as you know, the United States called... We need to fix the mic. Sorry. Uh, here. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry for the interruption. Just a few days ago, as you know, the United States called for a ceasefire uh, for the warring sides to meet for peace mm -hmm. talks. What do you make of the timing of this push for a ceasefire by the United States? Because until now, both the US and the UK had resisted calling for a formal ceasefire, had resisted getting behind the efforts of the United Nations. What do you make of the timing? And do you think this marks a, a significant moment, a turning point in the war? <laughs> the international community is, has awakened and now know the real size of this catastrophe. They made a mistake by delegating Saudi Arabia and the Emirates by giving them the free hand and the upper hand on what is taking place in Yemen. I think the timing is perhaps linked to the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, the martyr Jamal Khashoggi. But this case has nothing to do with Khashoggi again. I think that the war should stop now. And I think that uh, all those who have led to the blockade of Yemen, the hunger, the starvation, the destruction, all of them should be held accountable. With regard to the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, if some people think 
or some countries think that they can save MBS as a result of his heinous crime that he committed and the terrorism that he carried out against Khashoggi. Is this going to lead to the closing of other dossiers, such as the dossier of Yemen? No, no, we're going to hold him accountable. MBS and MBZ are both are going to be held accountable before international courts. This war should stop and the perpetrators, those who have led to the commission of such uh, crimes would be held accountable. ...to change as a result of Jamal Khashoggi's murder, or do you think this is just the status quo that's going to continue? It'll be business as usual in just a matter of weeks or months. The outrage is there now, for sure, but do you expect any changes in Saudi Arabia's relationship, in the West's relationship with Saudi Arabia? Yeah. I do believe that the phase after Khashoggi is not going to be as the situation was before Khashoggi. The whole region is going to change. His blood is not going to have no price. This is for sure. But I hope that the United States of America and the West, that they're not going to give precedence to their interests at the expense of values. We hope that uh, the different weapons deals are not going to be dearer than the blood of Khashoggi, not only the blood of Khashoggi, all those who oppose uh, authoritarian regimes. Uh, what had happened to Khashoggi is a very dangerous message. Uh, if the perpetrators run away from accountability, this is a very dangerous message. Everybody opposes those who oppose the regime should understand that that they have to be steadfast. So this is a message to all authoritarian regimes. Uh, we hope that there's not going to be any impunity as a result of that. Uh, we hope that the international community is not going to understand this crime against humanity. This is a terrorism that was practiced by a state against Khashoggi and against its own citizens. And now it is carrying out the same kind of terrorism inside Saudi Arabia and even in my own country. Do, we've heard condemnation, of course, from Western governments over the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. But Arab leaders have remained silent for the most part. We've heard, in fact, uh, some countries like the UAE, Bahrain, uh, standing in solidarity with the Saudi government, which has been, uh, as you know, facing backlash over Jamal Khashoggi's murder. Why do you think this is? Why this deafening silence from the Arab world? Is it about Saudi Arabia's influence in the region? Or perhaps would criticizing Saudi Arabia for the killing of a journalist amount also to criticizing themselves and their own shortcomings when it comes to human rights? <laughs> I don't think they can do anything. These regimes are authoritarian regimes. They cannot do anything. They are under the mercy of Saudi Arabia and the Emirates because they fear and they want the Emirates at the same time. So we do not expect anything other than silence. The, the, the West should not be silent. And most important, the journalists themselves should continue their battle uh, against what happened to Jamal Khashoggi because this is something that is important for all journalists of the world. Killing, killing Khashoggi is killing all the journalists of the world. Dismembering him is dismembering all the journalists of the world. And you will not uh, uh, stay uh, without saying anything of uh, human rights and media freedom in the Arab world today. Would you say it's worse today than it was uh, before the Arab Spring? Uh, uh, the Arab Spring. The, the most important thing in the Arab Spring. The most important thing in the Arab Spring. Sorry, you have technical problem. Uh, uh, 
So, when the first stage of the Arab Spring succeeded in toppling four dictators in four countries, the first objective after the objective was to guarantee the freedom of expression. And once the counter-revolution was able to, to reach the, the leaders and the military, uh, the first thing they the first thing they did was targeting and stopping freedom of expression and because this freedom of expression had been able to, com to document uh, what was happening. Nevertheless, as I said, these revolutions are usually like that. Every great revolution is, is, is comes after peaceful revolution, and uh, but the peoples must stay attached to their values, their sacrifices to until they achieve their goal of a state of democracy and justice. And waiting for this uh, victory and, and seeing all this uh, deterioration of freedoms all over the world, the Arab world, uh, this and there is also a violation not only of freedom of expression, no, there is something more serious, which is the right of living, of existing, and because people are being killed. I have so Shukran. Uh, Shukran. Uh, about Yemen. Let's talk a bit more about what's happening inside Yemen right now. And in, in your statement there, uh, you criticize Saudi Arabia. Uh, when, when we were forced to flee Yemen in, in 2015, uh, after Houthi rebel fighters attacked your home. Now, at the time, you were, of course, a vocal opponent of the Houthis, but some would say you seem to be supporting, then, the Saudi intervention, the Saudi Emirati intervention in, in your country. Today, you're describing Saudi Arabia as an occupying force. So what's changed as far as you're concerned? When did you have this revelation that the Saudis, after all, weren't perhaps the good guys in this conflict? Um, here I would like to accept, I never announced uh, that I sub completely supported the Saudi Emirates uh, intervention that, that was called the Arab coalition under the leadership of Saudi. I never, uh, but... You never supported it. But for some time, I kept silent. I kept silent for some time. I did not uh, announce any support or any being against. And that is as a result of uh, the, the coup d'etat that was led by Ali Muhammad Saleh with the militias against the legitimate authority in the country and against the resolutions of the Security Council, which in uh, uh, 2016 has put Yemen under Chapter 7. The world uh, in general thought that this intervention, the limited intervention, and within a limited period of time, uh, is within by an authority given to Saudi Arabia to, by the world to... But it was President Hadi who asked for outside... Was it or not? No, this is wrong information, completely wrong. Uh, President Hadi uh, was against the Saudi Emirate intervention in Yemen while he was uh, on his way from Aden to Saudi Arabia. Uh, 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 he, he, and he said, in fact, in one of his interviews, the Saudi Emirates uh, intervention is, uh, but it is the coup d'etat. And I think that uh, only people who well know what happened in Yemen know that, that the coup d'etat by itself, the, the, by Houthis and Saleh, against the legitimate authority in September 2014, was under instructions, the orders of Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, and financed by them. And this is a, a, a paradox. Uh, and, and in fact, Iran allowed that. Iran had got used to that. The Arabs uh, present uh, gains to, uh, to Iran uh, on a plate of uh, gold. And uh, because uh, this was the means that would give the, them the way to intervene and to impose the sponsorship and occupation of, uh, of Yemen. And, uh, and the result was uh, this final plan. But. But 
what they don't know is that this Yemeni people are stronger than them and will be victorious and they will stay and they will be defeated and the Yemeni people will be victorious. Traversi, Taakul Karman, concerning your relationship with Saudi Arabia. I want to come back to that because I think it's very important that you make it clear what your position is vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia because it's been a very ambiguous one, right? What do you respond to people who accuse you of switching sides, of those who say that in the beginning you did support the Saudi intervention and now that the tide has turned, you've switched sides? Um, Abadan? Not at all, not at all. When I, found, I got acquainted with the uh, secret agenda of the Emirates and the Saudis, I, uh, and this was an eye-opener for me. And, uh, and then uh, after a year of the blockade on Qatar, now my might be because I'm in Qatar that, uh, and because Qatar is under blockade, uh, uh, I have announced uh, this opposition against Saudi Arabia. No, this is not true. I have announced this a year ago in Colombia in, in the Conference of International Youth, uh, and this was uh, covered by Reuters and many media that I announced that. Uh, they, they all said the, that I attacked the, 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 and described the Saudis and the Emirates as occupation force, and I said that President Hadi is under house arrest. So my position, uh, regarding Saudi Arabia and Iran, and also uh, it is based on uh, based on the, on the interests of the Yemenis and uh, how, and what how much they serve the Yemeni people. But they treated our people, uh, and I say that one day Qatar and Saudi Arabia will be reconciliated, uh, especially now uh, some sort of uh, deals that are going on after the uh, case of uh, Khashoggi. So one day Qatar and Saudi Arabia will be back to normal relations. Will this change my position? Will this change my position against Saudi Arabia and the Emirates or any country that destroys my country? Definitely not. Definitely not. My role and my voice will continue as it is against anyone who attacks attacks my country and destroys it and destroys its uh, sovereignty. I might, I might ch in one, cha one case, I might change. If they change their policies, then I would welcome them. To ask you questions, many observers in, in this Yemen conflict have focused on the external actors around Saudi Arabia, the interventions they've led. If these interventions do end because hopefully they will end soon. How do you get the stakeholders in Yemen to agree to a national government? How do you get them all to reach peace? And in this Right now, at this very, uh, uh, right at this very moment, if the the Emirates and Saudis interventions and Iranians will stop, the Iranians will can sit together to one table and discuss uh, their peace and the stability of their country. At this very moment, I assure you, the the, um, the Yemenis have the will to do so. Adazet, throughout their history, the Yemenis went through different conflicts and fights, but they reconcile because the Yemenis are not to be tolerant and to be, uh, and uh, but, uh, but uh, especially of seeing the treaty and uh, how they were hit in their backs by friends. Uh, so this makes them even keen. But what about the southern separatists? They, the, the hastily negotiated uh, agreement uh, of 1990, the unification agreement, didn't address the grievances of the southerners, uh, you know, about representation and distribution of, of resources. The southern grievances still haven't been addressed. How do you deal with those today in the current context? We have already talked to this in the, in the National Dialogue Conference for nine months. We discuss all the important issues, including the, this issue. And we have come to a good outcomes that are enough that to give the South all their rights, especially the partnership in power. The South and others, but especially in the South, but this applies to other regions. 
you say, you know, once the outside interventions end, everybody is going to come together and, you know, live happily ever after in Yemen. But it's more complicated than that, as you know. There's Al Qaeda, there's the Southerners. How do you get all these actors, internal actors, together? Anyone who can see the uh, Yemeni scene and uh, and uh, we might not understand this, but we have lived in this country and we know all the details, we know the Qaeda was there, and, and we know it's easy to cooperate between us. It's easy to cooperate with Al-Qaeda? Yes, yes, uh, I'll tell you why. First of all, the idea of peaceful action by itself was was a, an, an idea that uh, uh, not given importance to fight the ideas of terrorism. We have led a peaceful uh, struggle throughout the beginning of the revolution, the, through the, the, the many revolutions. Before the revolution of Yemen, the, everybody was speaking about terrorist action, but if within two years of the revolution's life, no, there was no even one terrorist uh, activity. Why? Because the the peaceful struggle was confronting terrorism and it was successful. Not only Yemen, in fact, this applies to other countries of the Arab Spring. Uh, and the other thing, terrorism by itself is something used by the tyranny and the dictators uh, uh, as a as a tool to man, to maintain their power and to stay in uh, in power. Ali Abdullah Saleh had was the first one and the strongest supporter of Al Qaeda. He provided them with weapons, money, uh, and they transported them from one uh, uh, governor to another, and. And this, this, this was done before the revolution and rejected by the uh, all the officials. But lately, and finally, the Security Council, and according to you, a uh, decision uh, pinpointed the relationship of Al Saleh with the Qaeda. So we have a real force to confront Al Qaeda and terrorism. The security solution is not the only one. The solution, security, is one of other so solutions that could uh, reinforce democracy and could uh, improve uh, uh, combating uh, corruption and other things. And uh, and but this not we don't know, we oversimplify things. No, we have a good vision about strategic partnership with the international community to combat terrorism. Of course, there's, there are other details, many, a lot of details. If anybody wants uh, to study uh, terrorism would know, would know that there's a strong relation between terror, uh, tyranny and uh, terrorism. Both are two faces of the same coin. If the dictators leave and there are no dictatorship, the terrorism would disappear and or would be at least be very much limited. You know, there are areas in Yemen that are stable today, as you said yourself, uh, Marib, for instance. Uh, there are functioning parts of this country today. Um, you know, a lot of people wonder why not focus on these areas to build peace. Start, start from, from these areas, do a grassroots movement perhaps. What, what do you think of that? Uh, in fact, we, there is a good example uh, of, of having the beginnings of a good uh, state, Ma'rab. Ma'rab. And before the war, right now it is the only area that is stable, before the the war was the governor that was always accused by Muhammad Saleh that to be the region of kidnapping, terrorism, and the source of terrorism and problems. This was the way it was described by Ali Saleh at the time. But when the government gave Ma'rab, uh, Ma'rab became a very good example because it's one of the difficult uh, regions in the Yemen, but was the first region to, to transfer to the beginnings of uh, the Yemeni state that we want. But, but why? Why did the, the president go to Ma'rab to Hadramaut? Uh, if the legitimacy goes comes back to Yemen and it could be represented there, then there will be other. Plans. 
uh, other people to, to also uh, ask you a, a few questions. One last one. Uh, you know, today we keep hearing about the legitimate government of, of Yemen, internationally government, recognized government of Yemen, but President Hadi's mandate expired, what, four years ago under Yemen's constitution. Who do you see as the wise leader for Yemen today? Who should take over once the war ends? The Yemenis can come together and decide. Uh, right now, the important thing is that when you speak about legitimacy in Yemen, we, sh uh, we, 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 it's not, we don't only mean that the President Hadi, because the, 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 there's the, 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 the legitimacy is uh, missions, jobs, things to be done by the Yemenis, by the other countries, international community. So it's important to agree on a government, a national government, and not this last government that was appointed by the uh, uh, Saudi ambassador. He, he was appointed by the uh, Saudi Esther. The first statement he made, he said that he, he has no, no, no say neither in the security or political or military issues. So we need a national government, uh, the concept of all the Yemenis, uh, or a technocrat gov uh, government that under the sponsorship. Um. The Yemenis must agree on someone. I will not uh, pinpoint someone. President Hadi, Ahmed, uh, the, uh, the political leaders, uh, all are being supported uh, and uh, they are all under house arrest in Yemen. And, and their presence, in fact, is uh, not useful to Yemen. What we need is to have a political independent decision in Yemen. The first step to liberate Yemen is to liberate the political decisions and the return of the president, his government, and the security apparatus to run the affairs of the country from inside. I'm, I'm speaking about the liberated areas before speaking about other. Well, I, I know a lot of you uh, uh, follow the situation in Yemen very closely and have questions for Tawakul Kalman. So please uh, go ahead. Uh, is there a microphone? Okay, uh, th there's a, a lady in the front row here. Please go ahead. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you. I'm going to t ask the question in English. Do you think that the different parties that are calling for a solution or the ceasefire within a month, do you think that these parties are serious or is this just a kind of a propaganda for the elections that are going to take place in the US, the midterm elections? I hope that that the war is going to end in a period less than a month. I think we need a real resolution by the international community, a decisive decision in order to put an end to the war. And we do not want uh, that they consider that the end of the war is just the end of the bombardment or the shelling. I think they have to put an end to the occupation, to the trusteeship that is taking place. Uh, and we need real efforts for us to be able to reach a political settlement that is going to lead to such an end. And also the withdrawal of the Saudis and the Emiratis. We have to start with those steps. Thank you for the clarification. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you. So you would like to thank you very much. You remind me of the strife, the Arab strife, the other revolutions. You're very, very rational. But uh, it is like scientific or science fiction. So those who are fighting to regain legitimacy are the same ones are fighting against legitimacy in Egypt. What is really, really funny in Egypt, those who are against legitimacy are supporting legitimacy in Yemen. This is a kind of a cirque or a kind of a circus taking place in Yemen. Yes, we have marginalization dismantlement, fragmentation. They would never want a strong Yemen close or in the border on border with the Saudi Arabia. Yes, uh, Khashoggi 
has been killed. Do you think that Tawakkal Kerman can continue with the same mission that was started by Khashoggi? Do you think that you would be able to lead this uh, movement that would lead to the retrieval of the Arab Spring? And we're going to be with you. We want this Arab Spring to be retrieved and started once again. Yes, we are heading in order to achieve that. The Arab Spring has not come to an end, has not been put up. No, yes, it has been subjected to regional and international uh, conspiracies. The people of the region did not were not wanted to own their own decisions. The people of the region, others do not want them uh, to liberate themselves. Uh, so we have the interest of the international community and the international community wants to keep its own hegemony. But there is no doubt that this Arab Spring is going to continue. The Arab Spring is facing a counter-revolution. And any people that wants to put an end to authoritarianism is going to be faced by similar kind of endeavors. But we never surrender. We're not going to surrender. I met with Khashoggi many, many times, and we discussed this matter together. What we are facing is a chapter that should be gone through, that we, sh we need to go through, sorry, for us to be able to reach uh, freedom. The same applies to the Su Syrians. Do you think that the Syrians have stopped? Uh, resisting Bashar al-Assad, we are still, still fighting for independence and freedom. We are still at the beginning of this uh, phase. Uh, the age of this revolution is only seven or eight years old. Yes, what you said is right. Yes, the objective, the objective of uh, the war on Yemen is to dismantle, to fragment Yemen, to make it a failure state. Uh, even if uh, they say, even those who want to unify the whole of Yemen, they are in illusion. They do not want that. No, they want to divide it into cantons, into small parts, uh, for them to be able to carry out and exercise their trusteeship on Yemen and also to loot our wealth. This is their dream. This is what they want to achieve. This is the truth. But we know very well. We know very well the capabilities of the people. We know what the people want, what they can do. We are not going to lose hope. We know that the Yemenis are going to strive and keep on striving to pay the price of their freedom. The same applies to Syria. The same applies uh, to Egypt. Those who are imprisoned are not going to surrender. They have not done so, and they are not going to do so. They know that the Arab Spring is going to come again and again, as long as there are authoritarian countries and regimes, as long as those failure states and corrupt states, uh, uh, states uh, that... Uh, as long as they exist, the Arab Spring is going to be retrieved. It is going to be practicing what it did at the beginning. This is a promise. It is not a promise from me. This is the promise of the youth of the Arab Spring. And if this is not going to be seen today, believe me, the coming generations are going to have that. So if this price is not paid. Our ancestors have paid the price for the coming generations. Take now three to four questions at the, time, at the same time so that she can, she can perhaps answer uh, everything at once. Uh, let's do the lady here in the second row. And, uh, we'll do the middle row as well. Let's start with the lady in the second row, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sheikh Al-Zahri. Thank you for this presentation. My question is, is it still possible to implement some of the UN resolutions, especially 2216? Because we've noticed the, the, this, uh, uh, this uh, resolution solves the problem of Yemen, which is stopping uh, uh, provision of arms to Yemen. And so do you think that... Uh, the Saudi Arabia's interest uh, to implement this resolution and stop uh, the the Houthis from getting weapons uh, f through some uh, some of the uh, ports such as Hodeida and others in the south. Because if they g do this and they stop the the 
the flow of weapons, the Houthis will not be able to shoot ballistic uh, missiles. So if the international community, especially Saudi Arabia, if think of this, uh, if they only uh, control the ports, they will, it will be easy to put an end to the war. But it's not logical. After three years of the war, uh, since 2015, the Houthis still are capable to shoot uh, uh, missiles into Saudi Arabia. So do you think it's still possible to implement this UN resolution? Thank you, Tawak Kulkarman, for this very good presentation. Given the present situation of Saudi Arabia now, it is under a lot of pressure because of killing Khashoggi. So, the issue of humanitarian uh, uh, sufferings uh, is now another fo point of focus in, in the world. So, do you think now it is uh, suitable or possible that? Uh, the issue of focusing on human aid to the world of Yemen according to an action that will include uh, uh, an international cooperation with humanitarian organization. If you agree with this, what will be your efforts now to achieve this, to put an end uh, to the war in Yemen? I would like to salute you for your efforts, Mrs. Tawakkul Kerman. When we try to imagine the picture in the light of a, st of a world that is governed by institutions, maybe talking about small solutions afterwards is maybe too early. I think that uh, your role is very important indeed because you have kept uh, uh, the efforts continuing. So, yes, we have an international silence, but if we do not try to put an end to this silence, nothing is going to be useful. So we have to continue combating and resisting this silence. Uh, and uh, with all due respect about uh, Khashoggi, but the world kept silent vis-a-vis -vis so many killings that took place in the world. With all respect to Khashoggi, what are they going to do when it comes to his death? I want to take one more or do you want to respond? Yeah. And the, another one. Okay, another question, please. Uh, let's do the lady over there. Um, yes, please. Mrs. Tawakul, I would like to welcome you here. I would like to ask you a question. Does the international community fear Saudi Arabia? And why wouldn't the international community stop the war on Yemen? We have had so many calls to put an end to this war. But this is only going to be implemented, putting an end after this crime that has been committed against Khashoggi because we have enough evidence that uh, incriminates Saudi Arabia. Resolution 2216 is very important indeed and the international community has had this resolution in addition to many other resolutions. Uh, so. Yemen has had so many resolutions, so many resolutions have been issued, but what we need is not resolutions, is what we need is not resolutions, is we need implementation on the ground. This resolution 2216 has been misused by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. What they have implemented out of this resolution is to impose the blockade on the weapons, for the weapons not to be in the hands of the Houthis. But they haven't done anything else. You talked about the liberation of the different ports in Yemen. I wrote yesterday and I said what is happening by Saudi Arabia is not a liberation of Hodeida. This is an occupation. So if these regions are liberated and if the legitimate authorities are empowered in Yemen, if uh, these powers are in the hand of the legitimate authority, because Saudis have said they are waging war because they want to retrieve legitimacy. 
the situation would have been different altogether. We see what is happening in the different ports, in the different airports, if all these areas where we have oil and gas have been brought back to the legitimate authority or power. But this has not happened. They liberate those areas from the Houthis, uh, and either they go going to be managed by the Saudis or the Emiratis, or they hand them over to another militia that has no loyalty to the uh, legitimate authority. So there are lies that are being told here. When they say that they're implementing 2216, uh, no, they're undermining this resolution and they are the most important parts that, or parties that impede the implementation of 2216. Ending the war is a must now because Yemen is facing an unprecedented humanitarian catastrophe. Yemenis cannot bear this suffering, this humanitarian suffering. This war should stop, should end. Uh, yes, we need to uh, network with different organizations, different states, agencies, with the international community as a whole in order to put an end to the war. We raise awareness, we exercise pressure inside and outside Yemen in order to put an end to this war. But as I told you, ending the war does not mean at all to stop the bombardment or the shelling. The war is much larger. The details of the war, the war against Yemen by Saudis and the Emiratis, it is much larger than the stop of the bombardment, the stopping of the bombardment. And the whole war should stop starting with the end of the bombardment. With regard to Mr. Khashoggi, we should not underestimate this heinous crime that had been exercised. And we should not compare this crime to any other crime. And linking the crime of killing Khashoggi with the violations that are taking place in other regions in Syria, linking them together is not right. The violations that have been committed, this is a war crime. This is a crime against humanity. A journalist uh, has entered the consulate. He was killed. His body was, was cut into parts and acid was used. This is a heinous crime. The perpetrators should be held accountable, starting from those who have dictated, have ordered such crime to be committed, ending with those who have carried out the uh, implementation of this crime. This journalist was killed in a very, very barbarian way just because he wanted to have freedom of expression, because he wanted to express himself. He was against the war on Yemen. And many times we discussed this matter. He was very much in favor and with the Arab Spring. And he said, it is in the interest of Saudi Arabia to support these new powers, the power of change in the different countries. What is taking place in Yemen, in Syria, all these crimes that have been committed, all the perpetrators should be held accountable. We do not want to have any impunity in those countries. So the, he, the international community wants the money of Saudi Arabia. After the killing of Khashoggi, the international community should stop, the West should stop undermining, not giving importance to the values they, they cherish, and not give precedence any more importance to their own material interests at the expense of those values. If this does not happen. This is going to undermine regional and international security and peace. MBS constitutes a real danger when it comes to international peace and security. There, unfortunately, I know a lot of you had more questions to ask to Tawak Kaman, but we have to leave it there, unfortunately. Thank you Thank so, you so very much. much. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the Brooklyn Center Center for all the Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.